Hello. My hair is getting longer and my eyes hurt, so I'm wearing my glasses. Sorry. If you were used to me and my other, you know, visage, my apologies. I wanted to do something a little different today. I've been reading a lot of theory, a lot of academic books, and it made me really miss talking about just literature. What is it, man, that we even like? And the reason I bring this up is because I was especially thinking about modernism. I was super into modernism in high school. In a lot of ways, it's what got me into reading. And I realized through my interactions with other people that modernism, understandably, is an extremely tricky term. And we don't often always know what it means, how it's being used. It's kind of a catch-all phrase. And so what I wanted to talk about is modernism. Is it an era? Is it a genre? Or is it an attitude? And the main goal of this is to provide you, the audience, if you're interested, perhaps, you know, you encountered modernism as you, as you do in high school curriculum, but you don't always get a good sense of the larger scope. And because of that, it's an intimidating thing to jump back into. So I wanted to offer some quick thoughts, some suggestions, things you might be interested in. For the sake of this video, I wanted to stick with English speaking modernism. And the reason for that is there's so many different forms of modernism throughout the world. I figured we'd start here. And if people are more interested, uh, I'd be happy to go over like Italian modernism, German modernism, all that. So you're not gonna see like Kafka in here or anything like that. I'm really just gonna focus on English speaking writers. So like I said, modernism is a hard subject to approach because it's taught as so many different things. In high school, it's taught as usually either one of two ways based on what I've observed and what I experienced, is that it's either an era, so the year spanning roughly 1890 to 1945 or 1940, somewhere in World War II. Uh, this is good and helpful because the fact of the matter is a lot of writings are historically based, and I'll talk a little bit about that more. And a lot of people think that the kind of heyday of modernism or high modernism as people call it was, you know, the late teens, the 20s and the 30s. And it kind of, by the time you get to the 40s, people start to discuss late modernism, which I'll touch on briefly. If you weren't taught modernism as an era spanning a certain number of years, you were probably taught that it's kind of a, a mood or it's a collection of poetic techniques, such as stream of consciousness, fractured narratives, fractured poetry, the use of multiple languages, both literal multiple languages in a single text, but also differing languages between, say, the narrator and their characters. The blend of the high narrative literary voice with the low speaking voice of the lower and middle class inhabitants of a given novel. If there's one thing you were certainly taught, and I think this is true, is that a lot of modernist literature attempts to capture the chaos and cacophony of modern society as it moves from, you know, the early 19th century into industrialization, into the First World War, which of course carries connotations of globalism. So what do we do and how do we represent a world that suddenly has way more people from all over the place, all over the place, that is losing its great meta-narratives of the past? But like the great question, sicko mode or Mobamba, I think it's helpful to say to ourselves, why not both? Modernism is certainly an era in that the works are a part of their time and they're reacting to a certain historical moment. On the other hand, uh, we can think of modernism, I think, as a genre in that it uses certain poetic techniques, but we can also think of it as just a mood, a frame of mind, a way in which individuals during the early 20th and late 19th centuries were coping with the changes in society very differently from writers uh, that came before them. The key is kind of a move from realism or naturalism into a more subjective, expressionistic portrait of what it means to live in a increasingly industrial society. One could say the point, therefore, is modernism in a way attempts to capture the individual lived subjective experience of everyday individuals in their mundane lives as opposed to the novels of the past, which tend to focus on aristocracy, rich people, etc., And how can we go about 
portraying the lives of everyday people with honesty, but not objective reality, quote unquote. And I'll get into why this matters. So modernism, of course, like any literary movement, genre, era, has its predecessors, has things that influenced it. And so with modernism, it's helpful to think of what is sometimes called pre-modernism, which is a nice catch-all for things that aren't quite modernism, especially era-wise. They were written before 1890, um, but also don't exactly capture the same nuances of subjective lived experience in modernism, but nonetheless start to show a trend towards moving away from what was the subject of novels in the 16th, 17th, 18th century and starting to shift focus. In the 19th century, we have writers like Melville, Dickens, Dostoevsky, who began to change what the subject of the novel could be. For instance, it's weird that I mentioned Dickens as a pre-modern, but actually he plays an immense role in the uh, movement from really Dickensian Victorian literature to realism to naturalism to modernism. In that, Dickens was extremely concerned with how industrial society plagued the poor, how it created an entirely new class of people who could be subjected to oppression and evil. And he mostly uses children to demonstrate this. Dickens is probably one of the greatest social moral writers of the 19th century. Um, but keep that in mind, he's a moral writer. He's trying to tell you what's right and what's wrong. And he's often very effective at doing so. Melville, likewise, is going to experiment with new techniques. And in this way, we think of him as like a proto-formal modernist or even postmodernist. Different voices, the use of different genres in the same work. I mean, Moby Dick has plays, monologues, poems, all sorts of stuff, many different characters. And kind of like a proto-postmodern or proto-modern or whatever you want to say, uh, a lot of Melville's works are open-ended. They don't have a nice moral for you at the end. In fact, the struggle of a lot of Melville's writings is struggling with the lack of a moral, the lack of a didactic, well, here's now, this is the meaning of the work. Now go and live your life. And I mentioned Dostoevsky because he was heavily influenced by Dickens and something Dostoevsky did was deep psychological analysis. I, If I had more time, I'd get into how psychology as a discipline influenced modernism, especially William James, who invented the word stream of consciousness, to the works of Sigmund Freud that placed a new emphasis on the unconscious, the things that aren't said. But Dostoevsky is an excellent example of someone who used the Dickensian uh, portraying the lower middle class, their struggles, not only financially, but religious and philosophical struggles uh, in all stratospheres of um, Russian society. He mixes between, you know, the poor and crime and punishment and the very rich and the idiot. And again, the key there is psychological depth. And what I mean by that is uh, Dostoevsky is less concerned with telling you a story as he is conveying to you multiple characters with multiple points of view and having you, in a similar way to Melville, trying to struggle and meditate with yourself to figure out what it is you believe. Now in pre-modernism, there's something called realism, which kind of turns into something called naturalism, which I'll talk about briefly. And we got, got to be a little careful with this term because realism kind of suggests that the authors are attempting to portray life as realistically as possible. Uh, in reality, what they're attempting to do is show how the kind of mundane, everyday experiences of individuals affect society, affect culture, affect themselves um, without the kind of avant-garde edge that we're going to see in modernism. Realism arises at the same time Impressionism does in painting. And similarly, Impressionism is the product of the Industrial Revolution because pho photographs arrive and suddenly you wonder, well, what's the point of taking paintings that uh, pretend to emulate nature perfectly when you can just take a photograph? And that's an oversimplification of in uh, Impressionism, but bear with me. Um, and so Impressionist painters started to say, I'm gonna capture my subjective experience interacting with nature, interacting with reality, which results in, of course, uh, very unique paintings that are not at all realistic in the sense, but they attempt to capture the impressions of the individual when looking at nature or a city. 
which is an increasingly popular subject. Out of writers like Dickens and Dostoevsky, we get writers like Henry James in America, who in his early career is a realist par excellence. Um, and what I mean by that is he's really focusing on the lived experiences of everyday individuals. Granted, he's focused more usually on the upper class their struggles as they attempt to deal with the, the death of aristocracy and how aristocracy is slowly dying out in favor of capitalism and its malleability in terms of how people can move around the social spheres, both economic and cultural. And James is going to, at the end of his career, make a nice bridge between realism and modernism by starting to really focus on psychological depth, even more so, I would argue, than Dostoevsky, to the point where he adopts his brother, William James's idea of the stream of consciousness, and attempts to capture individuals' lived experience. But in Henry James, you won't find experimental novel writing techniques that you will find in modernists, as we'll get into. Instead, he's a really good bridge between the moods of realism and modernism. Other pre-modern writers worth mentioning in this vein are Thomas Hardy, someone who captures the lower middle class quite well, is usually quite pessimistic, interested in portraying things as they are, hence realism and their sadness. Other authors worth mentioning are Stephen Crane, who in his short stories especially, even though these are a little later, captures again the drudgery, the misery of city life, and Theodore Dreiser, who's another late naturalist, you could even call him a modernist, I think, uh, but he's really focused more, not so much on the global issues surrounding you know, war and poverty and changing artistic styles. He's really focused on how poverty creates tragedy in America. I need to talk about Joseph Conrad also very briefly because he's a really weird transitional figure. He uses very sparse, direct language, but it's imbued with an almost biblical seriousness and hardiness and aggressiveness that makes him a prefiguration of many modernist writers. But Conrad, for all his difficulty, also begins to use things that are especially modernistic. Namely, he explores themes of imperialism, themes of racism, themes of uh, how countries can delude themselves into doing horrible things. And likewise, he focuses on everyday people in a sense. So he's one of the first people to really use unreliable narrators, fanciful narrators, and bizarre characters that almost seem to blend between fantasy and reality in a really unique way that are, it's gonna have a huge influence on modernism. So of course, Joseph Conrad is worth mentioning. I'm not sure if I would call him a modernist or a naturalist. He's a really strange in-between. Now we arrive at modernism. I'm going to begin with American modernism because I assume that's what my audience is most familiar with, and then I'll move into English modernism. And what I mean by that is just European authors who wrote in English, um, not necessarily just British modernism. American modernism is extremely multitudinous and takes on so many forms. And again, we encounter that problem of is modernism a genre, a mood, or an era? And three authors I've chosen that everyone has heard of, um, I think are great exemplars of this. The first is Hemingway. Hemingway is an excellent introduction to the mood of modernism and modernism also in its place, historically rooted. He eschews morals, he eschews tightly knit narratives, and he's not interested in giving the reader an overarching meaning or point. I think that's one of the things you need to keep in mind when reading these modernists, is that they were really adamant about getting rid of any novels or short stories that had a point or something we could learn. Um, they don't want that. Instead, they wanna focus on the writing itself. And like Impressionist painting, trying to capture a subjective lived experience of a changing, increasingly globalized world. Hemingway, like a naturalist or like a realist, uses very sparse language, but he doesn't use this language to teach you something. Instead, what often is found in Hemingway is the unsaid words, the unsaid things, are actually where the most depth of what Hemingway's writings contain. And this is, of course, taught in high school, usually using the iceberg theory idea that Hemingway has like a surface level thing here, but underneath it, there's so much depth. And that's a good way to approach it. I think sometimes it can be taken a little too far, 
Uh, but the important thing to know about Hemingway is that he was inspired by journalism. He was a journalist. And so he took that idea of portraying things as quickly, as accurately, as descriptive as possible without being subjective, right? Yet, in his novels and short stories, Hemingway uses that style of objective journalism and places it on subjective lived experiences of his characters. And this creates a very confusing jumble, which I think is deceptively difficult. I think Hemingway is often taught and used in schools because he is a more approachable writer in a sense. You don't need to carry a dictionary with you and whatnot, but he creates an extremely complex dichotomy between his sparse language and the experiences that are subjective of his characters to the point where no one in his novels are morally superior to other people. Everyone's broken, everyone's confused, everyone's lost. A book I would highly recommend if you don't know where to start with Hemingway or you haven't read Hemingway since high school is this collection of short stories In Our Time, which looks like it's backwards in my camera. In Our Time is super, super underrated. I don't know why it's not taught more. It's a fantastic collection of short stories that most of which are interrelated, focusing on a character named Nick Adams. And what these stories do is over the course of the 150 pages of this, tell a bigger story. He uses fragmented stories to tell a bigger story, which is gonna be a huge, important part of modernism. Some people have even classified In Our Time as just a fragmented novel. I don't know if I'd go that far. There's definitely standalone short stories here, and each story can be read by itself and enjoyed by itself. But there is something to be said for reading the whole of In Our Time and getting a lot out of it. The writing here is sparse. A lot of people also, for some reason, fail to mention that Ezra Pound read and maybe edited parts of In Our Time, and his influence shows, as I'll get into. With Hemingway, like with Pound, less is more. And if you want to read a novel by Hemingway, I would highly recommend his first major novel, The Sun Also Rises. In a similar way to In Our Time, The Sun Also Rises is going to focus on what is not said and what is not shared in order to create a lot of tension between characters. There's more plot, there's more character building, but there are no conclusions reached. And again, what's not said is often the most powerful as the final lines of this book make very clear. They're, it's one of my favorite final passages of a novel. Now on to our guy, F. Scott Fitzgerald, who is a probably the most straightforward writer out of all the ones I'm mentioning today. And by straightforward, I mean he doesn't tend to use extremely difficult language. Instead, F. Scott Fitzgerald was really concerned with capturing the ennui, the melancholy, the kind of boredom and drudgery of modern life. Of course, the best place to start is The Great Gatsby, which I'm sure everyone had to read in high school, but if you read this in high school and you liked it, but you're like, I don't need to read it again, or you didn't enjoy it, please read it. Uh, the Great Gatsby is a classic for a reason. It's taught in schools because it's short and easy to read, um, but there is so much depth here. It's one of the few novels that every time I read it, I just get more and more out of. It is a never-ending uh, it is the gift that keeps on giving. The prose is hyper poetic, I would say. Uh, it almost prefigures, you know, the hyper poeticism of Nabokov. The narrator is suspect and confusing. Uh, he's hard to trust, but he's not like a bad person, so that creates a lot of tension. And the point of the novel is very, you know, it could be a lot of things. I think a lot of people boil it down to the American dream, nostalgia, regret, love, sadness. Uh, it can be all those things, but it's also a lot more. And I think primarily here what great, The Great Gatsby does so well is it captures, again, the shift from older classes and divisions between people and presents the new capitalist, industrial, global, sea change in how people live their lives. Kind of like Austen in the 18th century, who, when she makes fun of rich people by talking about kind of their absurdity and stupidity, F. Scott Fitzgerald does something similar here, only with the caveat that he introduces the distinction between people who are rich by birth, like in Austen's books, and people who are rich through these new capitalist ways of making a ton of money. Uh, some ways more respectable than others. And anyone reads the book who's read the book 
knows that that becomes a pretty pretty big plot point. There's a strong sense of despair, disquiet, regret, melancholy, ennui, but it's also really funny. And it's also, uh, again, an enigmatic book. For a book that is supposedly so easy to read and so accessible, uh, reread it, and then reread it again, and you will find that it is actually an extremely dense work for its conciseness and the clarity of its prose. I have to mention one of my favorite novels by him, This Side of Paradise. This is his debut novel, and it reads like a debut novel. I wouldn't say it's the masterpiece that Great Gatsby is, but it's an immensely entertaining book. Again, Fitzgerald is not using super avant-garde techniques in his writing, uh, and in fact, uh, This Side of Paradise is an excellent Bildungsroman of sorts. It follows a boy who moves from his kind of naive youth into disillusionment. But unlike the Bildungsromans of the Romantics, like Goethe, uh, Fitzgerald is going to kind of offer an anti-Bildungsroman, and I'll leave it at that. Fitzgerald is extremely influenced by naturalism. In fact, in This Side of Paradise, one of the struggles is between the pull of naturalism and realism and writing in that clear, direct style and the avant-garde and wanting to be a part of that new movement but not being sure if you really fit in. And Fitzgerald plays with this dichotomy in the text itself, uh, mostly opting to write in clear naturalistic prose. So I highly recommend This Side of Paradise if you wanna see an author struggling with the changes in literary styles. Out of the American prose writers I chose, Faulkner presents the most unique issue in that he, unlike Hemingway and Fitzgerald is a great exemplar of the poetic techniques of modernism. So he's going to use stream of consciousness, uh, fractured narratives, inconclusive stories with very sparse plots, bizarre mixes of humor and tragedy. He's going to collide all of this in a way that makes him more akin to the European modernists I'll mention in a minute. But for Faulkner, you have to remember that he stayed in America, unlike the other two writers I mentioned who spent much time abroad. He stayed in America for the most of his life and really wanted to engage with what it meant that as the South especially was becoming more industrialized and as people were beginning to look back on America's past, realize its brutality, its evil, how did people cope? What do you do when you lived on a plantation and now there's a town across from your house? Faulkner is going to attempt to capture this change, not through naturalism or realism, but through modernism, the subjective, again, lived experiences of individuals. This is on display nowhere better, and I think nowhere better to start, than with As I Lay Dying, a book that consists entirely of monologues from maybe like over 20 characters, I don't know. I read it not too long ago and was struck by the beauty of it and how he mixes so many voices. And again, what's going on in As I Lay Dying is yes, he's using these experimental modernist techniques, but he's supplementing that with meditations on the changes going on in American society, especially the American South. As I Lay Dying is an immensely rewarding and enjoyable book. Again, humorous, tragic, difficult, but also weirdly colloquial and easy to pick up. Now, if you've read As I Lay Dying or other works by Faulkner and you wanna keep going, I have to recommend my favorite, The Sound and the Fury. Here, the psychological depth is turned up to 11. You are stuck in the minds of three characters for a very long time before entering into an omniscient narrator. And the three characters, I don't really wanna spoil it, each represent very differing attempts to reconcile not only their personal lives, but the changes going on around them. You have Benji, who is an extremely unique character for anyone who's read the book. You have Quentin Compson, who is kind of a melancholic scholar who moves to college away from the South. And then you have Jason, this sadistic madman who I hate reading because it is painful to be in the mind of a sadistic crazy person for that long. And like the other books I've been mentioning, Faulkner does not reach a nice conclusion. The ending image of uh, The Sound and the Fury is a haunting and bizarre image to end a novel on. But nonetheless, I recommend it for the beauty of its prose. Faulkner is definitely the most difficult of these writers. Keep a dictionary ready. He invents his own words, for God's sake. And in addition to that, Faulkner has a probably the most unique prose style of an American writer, utilizing almost biblical language infused with Miltonic musings, infused with just grittiness, 
psychology and just, I guess people sometimes call it Southern Gothic in a way, and I guess that's true, just kind of like gross, you know, a lot of grossness, a lot of baseness. Um, but he's extremely poetic and a wonderful writer. So of course, this video is already shaping up to be quite long, but I need to mention some African-American literature. John Toomer's Cain is an excellent modernist view of the black experience in America. It mixes genres using songs, plays, short stories. In a way, it's a little bit like in our time in that it uses a bunch of short narratives that coalesce into this bigger narrative. Uh, and for that reason, I highly recommend it. On a similar note, I would recommend Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. It's a great place to start if you want to get into black literature, especially written by women, um, because this is, gonna, this is going to be the watershed text of black feminism in American literature that's going to pave the way, especially for writers like Toni Morrison in the postmodern era. So now on to the European English-speaking people over on the continent. Um, Ulysses is usually thought of as the benchmark of high modernism, and it is for a good reason. It kind of exemplifies everything we've been talking about, both in mood, genre, and era. But Ulysses is not the best place to start. It's tempting to just want to go pick up Ulysses and say you've read it. But you'll get a lot more out of Ulysses if you turn to James Joyce's first two works. Joyce was an Irish writer, and all of his writings, as far as I've read, uh, concern being in Dublin, being in this one city, even though he moved around quite a lot. You can start with Dubliners, which I would compare, and I might catch flack for this, to Hemingway's In Our Time. These are very sparse short stories that, like Hemingway, don't offer any sort of moral, don't offer any sort of conclusion, but they are excellent, excellent, excellent portraits of the changes that occur when a city like Dublin moves from its Catholic roots into more secular thinking and more secular culture. Uh, especially interesting is how these characters are not always miserable, but there's a very subtle melancholy that exudes through the whole book. It's written in a very plain style. It's not stream of consciousness. It's not super difficult. The only thing you'll need is a dictionary. I'm sorry I've been saying that a lot, but with the modernists, it's really important. Even reading just a few short stories like Araby or The Dead is a great primer. But if you want more Joyce being Joyce, I can't recommend Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man enough, one of my absolute favorite novels. This is where Joyce starts getting a little more experimental, where we start seeing the kind of staple genre poetic techniques of modernism at work. The story is a Bildungsroman of a young Irish boy named Stephen Dedalus, who is based on Joyce himself, moving from his very Catholic, very nationalistic upbringing into his calling as an artist. And what's most astonishing here is how Joyce uses that narrator to move along with the main character himself. So it begins in almost like babble baby-like language, but by the time it's over, we're ready for Ulysses. It picks up pretty much where Ulysses begins in terms of stylistic complexity, oddity, and depth. Now my favorite uh, English modernist would have to be Virginia Woolf, and it's hard to say where to start. You could look up some short stories, but they're not gonna give you the full breadth of Virginia Woolf. I would highly recommend starting with Mrs. Dalloway. This is a excellent uh, introduction to shifting narratives that explore how the Great War and globalization affect not only the people who we expect it to hurt, like veterans, but also how it affects housewives. And again, this novel, like many of these novels, is filled with regret, ennui, uh, even depression, I would say. But Wolf is a little different in that she does imbue her novels with a humanistic hope in a way. And I think if you read, it's less clear in Mrs. Dalloway, but if you read the next novel I'd recommend, which is my absolute favorite of Virginia Woolf, it's one of my all-time favorite works of literature, To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Excellent. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a little more complicated and disorienting than Mrs. Dalloway. But it's not so disorienting like her book, The Waves, that it's off-putting and unenjoyable. In fact, I think To the Lighthouse contains, of all these modernist books I've read, probably the most heartwarming and gut-wrenching portrayals of family 
it celebrates matriarchs, it celebrates the bonds of family, but it's accepting of how easily those are fractured, not only by people's shortcomings morally, but by culture itself, by society itself. When you've read these, you can move from there to other great authors, especially in America, John Dos Passos and his American Trilogy, and in England, uh, the works of D.H. Lawrence are fantastic. Again, he's one of those naturalism, modernism mixes. He reminds me a lot of like an unfiltered Fitzgerald in a way. So I highly recommend those. And of course, if you pick up any anthology, you'll be able to find plenty more modernist writers. I just think these are excellent places to start before you dive into the big heavyweight texts like Ulysses. Or maybe you just want to enjoy these works again or enjoy them for the first time. Already, this is an extremely long video, but I want to briefly go over poetry. First off, I want to say I would highly recommend the Norton Anthology of Modern Poetry, edited by Jehan Ramanzani. This is an excellent collection uh, that's going to give you great notes and context and little biographies for every writer I'm going to mention. Uh, I cannot recommend it enough. And the second volume, which gets into postmodern poetry, is also excellent. In America, we tend to think of T.S. Eliot as almost like a poster child for American modernism, especially in poetry. T.S. Eliot's poetry is, on the surface, actually kind of engaging, and on the surface, actually pretty approachable. And I might sound crazy for saying that, but let me explain. He uses the colloquial, and he uses the voice of really a thinly veiled version of himself, oftentimes in his early poetry, especially Prufrock, which if you're not sure where to start with Eliot, start with Prufrock. Now, when we get into the wasteland, Eliot's going to do a lot of the things he's most famous for. He's going to explore the fractured and cacophonous nature of globalization, how there are so many people in such small cities and how everyone's struggling to make sense of the world when we've lost God. And he does this through using multiple character voices, multiple languages, and allusions to everything from Buddhism to church fathers to occultism in the early 20th century. He does it all. So The Wasteland, of course, is the benchmark work by Eliot, but I would highly recommend starting with Prufrock and other poems for a good introduction before moving into The Wasteland. And as a side note, don't trust Eliot's notes to The Wasteland. They are intentionally misleading oftentimes. Find other notes if you really want to know more about the allusions. One of the influences on T.S. Eliot, in fact, one of the editors of The Wasteland was the aforementioned Ezra Pound. He is basically the Kickstarter of the Imagist movement. And by that, he was like, I'm gonna cut down language to its bare primal essentials. He describes things, but he doesn't just describe them to give you an objective portrait of them. Instead, almost like an impressionist painter, he wants to use words in tension with one another to create a kind of uncanny, new perspective on things that we know already pretty well, such as subways or trees. And if you get into the cantos, everything. Out of there, you can get into writers like William Carlos Williams, who uses imagism in a very similar fashion, although I think he's a little more nice. And similarly, I'd recommend Marion Moore as an excellent kind of post-T.S. Eliot meditator on the changes in society, eschewing kind of the normal forms of poetry in order to create something new. Briefly, I want to mention Robert Frost, who's not usually associated with modernists because he uses very formal poetic techniques, such as blank verse and occasionally, like, very old school Italian schemas. It's very interesting. But Robert Frost is actually a modernist in mood to the nth degree. Um, Robert Frost is easily the most deceptively difficult poet, poet in the English language because he is so entrenched in irony, so entrenched in intentionally deceiving you as an audience that you can meditate over his poems for a very, very, very long time. On the surface, presenting you with a message. Underneath this, he's extremely ambiguous and open-ended. Of course, The Road Not Taken, Birches, and one of my favorites uh, of recent, I came into it recently, The White-Tailed Hornet. Read these. And a mistake people often make when reading Frost is assuming that his narrators are him. Rather, Frost, like Eliot, loved to play with character narrators, people who had different points of view, and like the other works we've been mentioning, 
Uh, Frost was very concerned with the mundane, basic lives of lower to middle class people, especially in American uh, farmland and the outdoors, people who were struggling to move from the old 19th century ways of even communication and travel into the 20th century. And there's a nostalgia, but a thankfulness for moving on and a fear of the future. Wallace Stevens, probably the great philosopher poet, even though I hate that term of the 20th century, Stevens is immensely difficult on the surface and underneath the surface, he's still immensely difficult. My recommendations for reading Wallace Stevens, because I think you absolutely should, are understanding that Wallace Stevens loves to play with the impossibility of language to actually communicate what he wants to say. He argues for the death of God and argues that imagination exemplified through poetic art is going to take God's place. And for him, God originally even was just a imaginative force that we created. So in poems, which I recommend starting with Sunday Morning or The Doctor of Geneva, he's gonna struggle with these themes in a very arcane way. And again, I would say a dictionary is your best help with Stevens. That's my only advice. And then from there, move into his first collection, Harmonium. Lots of great stuff that is a blend of imagism, but also a blend of formalism. Highly recommend. The most difficult poet of them all, simply because you have to reorient yourself when you read her is Gertrude Stein. Uh, she almost writes cubist poetry in the same way that cubist painters wanted to present familiar objects from new points of view, something that Ezra Pound also does a little bit. But Gertrude Stein turns it up to 11. I mean, go read Tender Buttons, it'll make you view objects as simple as a coffee cup in brand new ways. Yes, she is extremely difficult, uh, but keep in mind that you need to reorient what you expect out of poetry in order to, I think, fully enjoy, uh, although that's probably not the right word. I guess the right word would be appreciating and meditating on Gertrude Stein's idiosyncratic reflections on objects in the natural world, really phenomenology, but that's a discussion for another time. Of course, there are many authors I didn't get to mention, Yeats, D.H. Lawrence's poetry, Wilfred Owen and war poetry, Auden as a nice bridge between the uh, modernist style and the postmodernist style, and of course, I need to mention another great bridge author, Samuel Beckett, who in his novels, and especially his plays, which if you're not sure where to start, aside from Waiting for Godot, Happy Days, excellent place to begin, where we begin to see the movement from modernism's kind of despair, sadness, ennui, into postmodernism's cheerful nihilism, playing with the fact that nothing means anything and that we might as well laugh in the face of death another video for another time. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was helpful. Again, at the end of the day, I hope you just found or thought of something that you've been meaning to read or something now that you want to read for the first time or revisit. Anyway, hope this was helpful. If you like it and want more, I love doing these kind of things, so let me know. All right, take it easy.